So we are recording this, so you can find this on YouTube uh, later on if uh, if you uh, you know the phone rings or you want to rewatch it um, and all that uh, cool stuff. Um, as we're jumping in here, um, just for the for the kind of house rules, um, I'm assuming most of you guys have already uh, used go to uh, webinar before, but uh, that little box over to the right, uh, you can uh, put in your questions, and it's definitely my intention to make sure that we get time for those. So, uh, so just start uh, firing away. I'll kind of like keep an eye on them as we go, um, and we'll definitely address those in the end. Um, so, let's see here. So. Um, I did one of these webinars, these Fusion basic webinars back in August, and that is up on the Fusion 360 YouTube channel. Um, I will share my email with you in a second. You can always email me if you want me to send you the link. I also did one of these uh, Fusion 360 Cam basics uh, uh, back in October 25th. Uh, so as you can see on the screen here, there are two different parts, uh, and today we're going to do another part. Now. Um, some of you guys maybe have been, uh, have seen the two other ones, but it's great. Um, and if you have not, that's not a problem either. We will still cover all the basics, uh, as we are going, um, going through here today. My hope with these, uh, the reason that I'm not just doing the same thing over and over again is because I try at each one to kind of introduce a couple of new helpful things. Uh, so uh, I would definitely say that if you are brand new to CAM with Infusion, uh, maybe, you know, if you have done CAM in other software for, you know, 10, 20 years, then you maybe don't have to go back. But if you are fairly new, I hope that that, that changing these up each time makes it, um, you know, a little bit more useful for you. Uh, so who am I? That's, you know, uh, probably um, in the right place. So my name is Lars Christensen. Uh, I am part of the tech marketing team here at Autodesk. Uh, the two only thing I think that is interesting about me is that I'm from Denmark, so that's why you, you get a little bit of an accent. I've been over here since 99. And then I'm actually a mold maker of trade. Uh, but I have, so I've worked in, in manufacturing industry for, for quite some years um, and, and done some, some interesting things I'm not going to bore you with here. Uh, maybe the most valuable thing is my email address, uh, lars.christensen at autodesk.com. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely, you know, like I said, if you, if you can't find those two previous uh, webinars up on the Fusion 360 YouTube channel, or if you just want to be lazy, uh, shoot, my, shoot me an email and I'll definitely uh, get you the link. Also, any uh, comments or suggestions uh, about this webinar or anything else, definitely either put them in the questions area or you are definitely always more than welcome to, uh, to shoot me an email. On top of that, I am uh, also out on social. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, so if you go out and search my name, Lars Christensen, on YouTube, um, I have a channel where I talk a lot about Ken and Cam. And also on Facebook, if you find my page there, I do Fusion 360, a weekly tip, uh, and, and some things there. And then, of course, would love to connect with you on LinkedIn and, and all that stuff. That's really all the slides that I had here for today. Uh, so uh, why don't we just um, jump into, uh, into the software and, and get going here. So Fusion 360. Uh, so the part that I kind of model up uh, here today, uh, or for today, looks a little bit different than um, than one you have seen in the past. Um, but a couple of things I just wanted to point out right off the bat. So you will see that my part is sitting in a vice. Um, you don't have to do that to use Fusion 360 Cam. You do not have to. The nice thing about it um, is that you can do like collision detection, gives you a good overview on what is happening on the machine and things like that. Um, and normally where I have gotten these vices and tables is actually from the vendors themselves. So if you go out to like, this is an orange rice, but if you go out to Kurt rice, uh, you can actually download all their different versions as files 
um, and then you can bring them into Fusion. Uh, but to make that better, if you go out to your main uh, data panel out here, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, uh, you will see that there is something called CAM samples. And if you go in there, there's X, there's a lot of things in here, but there's actually something called work, work holding. So we put a lot of stuff uh, in here, including this orange rise that you see on my screen, the curd rise, there's a uh, turning jaw, so forth, and a whole clamping kit uh, in here. Uh, so you can actually grab all this from here and use it if you, if you so desire. Also, if you are uh, questioning about how, um, how you get your part inside a device, if, if you haven't played around with components and all that, uh, joints and stuff inside of Fusion. Again, shoot me an email at lars.christensen at autodesk.com and uh, I have a YouTube video where I went through that. So just be aware that that is, um, is kind of an option in here. So a couple of things we're going to do. We're going to throw some toolpath on this part here and I'm going to start out where uh, from the basics because that is what this webinar is this is the camp basic webinar so we are going to talk about how you do your setup but another thing that I wanted to show today uh, was a lot of people have talked to me about how they get a little bit confused when they're talking about selecting chains within uh, fusion so I thought I will do something about that today so what we actually have here is you will see that this face here is actually about, I think it's 50,000 lower than this face and this face. So this is a little bit deeper down than these two faces over here. And that gives us a little bit of a challenge. Uh, so I just wanted to, to show that today. So that's one of the things that if you have watched the two other ones, this is definitely something I think you will benefit from today. So let's go in and do the basic uh, setups uh, for a part like this uh, inside of Fusion 360. So uh, we're going to go over to the drop down over here and just go in and select CAM, right? And the first thing we always have to do is we have to create a setup. And what the setup is, it is a way to tell the CAM how things are out at the machine. Because your machine is it's pretty rigid out there, right? What is Z and X and Y out of the machine? You ain't gonna change and, and your, your work envelope and all those things. The CAD is a lot more flexible. So the first thing we have to do is we gotta establish um, how is our coordinate system in the CAM and where are we going to pick, out this, uh, pick up this part out of the machine, right? We're not just gonna throw this vice on the table and walk away. We have to somehow tell the machine where this vice or this part is located. And we do that with the G54, G55, G56. So that's what we're setting in here. It's extremely easy to do, um, in my opinion. You just got to slow down a little bit. This is like one of these steps where you're just going to take a deep breath and just walk your way through it. So let's do that. So you go up here and you click on the setup. You would like to see we get this little fly out menu uh, that appears that tells you what the software is looking for. Use these because that is really helpful. So I'm going to click on that and uh, we get a menu um, that shows up here to the right. Now one thing you will notice is I get kind of like a shadow box around my entire uh, assembly here. Um, and that is because the software goes in and tries to find out um, <clears throat> what it can machine. And in this case, it finds 11 bodies. This is on, You only have to do this if you do have the vice and the table and everything on the screen. If you're just doing the single part, you don't have to worry about this. But what we have to do is we just have to tell the software what we're actually going to machine here. So I'm going to hit the little X over here and just select our part. This is all we have to machine right here. And as soon as I select that part, you will see that the shadow box goes around that part. So that's the first thing that kind of like pops up when we are in an assembly, is that we have to do that. So make a note about that. If I'm in an assembly, the first thing I have to do is to select what I have to machine. Now after that, what I recommend is that you work from the top and work your way down. 
Just every time you're inside these menus, make that a good rule. So the first thing we get is we get some different operation types if we want to be turning or milling. So this is clearly a milling part, so I can leave that. The next thing we have to do is we have to set our work coordinate system, um, also called uh, WCS. And what that is, is it is where we're selecting what is up and down on this part compared to what we have out of the machine and where we're going to pick up the part. And you will actually see we get a little resemblance of that over here. You will see I kind of like have that in the middle of the screen, the Z axis, the X axis, and the Y axis. And of course, in my world, if there's a 50-50 chance, it's always the wrong way. And you will see here that this is not right. Um, what you normally want on most machines is you want the Z, the blue, to point up towards the ceiling. You want the green Y to point towards the back of the machine and the red X to point towards your right hand. So that's what we're going to control here. And this is probably why more people get most confused. But here's my here's the way I do this. So when you go down here and you click on the drop down, you will see that you get some different options in here. Um, but I only use one. So that's make it, you know, I mean, I'm lazy when it comes to CAD and CAM. I have never had where I could not use the first one here. Call Select Z axis and the X axis. So if you write that down in your little notebook, that's the only one that you uh, really have to use uh, in here. So I'm going to select that, Z and X. When I do that, the menu changes a little bit, and you will see that the Z axis over here gets highlighted. Uh, it says nothing right now. So the way it works is that we can select on either faces or on edges, and whatever we select will control how that nomen or triad or over here uh, reacts. And I always go with faces. And the rule is that whatever face you select, the arrow will go perpendicular to that. So that means that here we have the z-axis. If I go over and select on top, and I can select anywhere on the model, doesn't really matter. But if I select on this top face here, the z-axis will become perpendicular to that face. Or, to say it another way, it will point either towards that face or right away from that face. So I'm going to click on that now. Three, two, one. And you see when I click on it, that automatically uh, the z-axis is now perpendicular to that face. Now, the way we're looking at it right now is actually the way we want it. We want the z-axis to point up towards the ceiling. We want the y-axis to point towards the back of the machine and the x-axis to the right. Now, you will see that it went down to highlight the, the x-axis down here. So we could actually move the x-axis if we want to. And just to show you how easy this is, if I want to rotate the x-axis to actually point the direction the y-axis is doing right now, again, the rule is whatever face you select, the arrow will be perpendicular to that. So if I went over and I selected this face right here, you see how it jumped? So now the x-axis is pointing in that direction. It's pointing perpendicular. Now there is a flip button over here. So if I wanted to point, flip it, I can just flip it. And I can do that. So you can flip it back and forth. But that's really how this works. So let me just hit the x next to the x-axis and just go over and select this face. And then it will be perpendicular to, to that. OK? So, you know, the easiest thing to do is just to kind of like, you know, open up uh, a, a, a rectangle and just play around with this. But the rule is just select the first one, the z-axis and x-axis, and then whatever face you're selecting, it's perpendicular to that. So now we have established uh, our x, y, and z. Now we're going to select where we are going to pick up. So where are you going to pick up out of the pot? And this really variates. Uh, people's preferences. So uh, mold makers, they like to pick up the center of the pot. That's kind of like what it defaulted to right here, right? If you put an indicator in, 
and you sear it out, you can place yourself in the center of the part. Now, uh, tool and die makers, they like to be in a corner. So if I go down here and select the box point, I can just go over and click on one of these snowballs over here, very soothing for the time of year. And you will see that wherever I click, that 3D gnomon will jump to that area. So I'm going to select this upper left corner over here. That is where, when I go out to my machine, I am going to pick up this part. All right? Pretty straightforward. Now, the next thing I'm going to go in and do is I'm going to select my stock. So what, what kind of stock options do I have? That's the next tab over here. So I'm going to click on that. And it defaults to what is called relative size box. What that really means is that the software have put a bounding box around our, our part here and have added 40 thousandths on the side and it have added 40 thousandths to the top and to the bottom. Okay? So I use this when I don't really know what kind of stock I'm getting. But, you know, I mean... On the shop floor, if you have the stock, you better measure it, right? So <laughs> if you go in here, there is something called fixed size box. So if you select that one, now you can actually put in the exact dimensions uh, of, your, of your part. Now, another thing you can do that I want to highlight is you can also bring it in from a solid. So if you are new to Fusion, what we have in here in the model environment is solid modeling. So you could actually 3D model of your stock and you could use that. Now what the stock does is it gives us a true view when we are simulating our tool path. So we get a really good view of what is actually going to happen out of the machine. So if I select the from solid, I can actually go out if I have my stock modeled up as a solid, and I actually have here. So let me just turn it on over here to the left. Um, so what I have is I actually have modeled up what the stock uh, would look like when you put it inside of the machine. The reason I did this was because you can see that this stock actually had a couple of extra operations that was drilled some holes in there. Uh, so I like to have that in there so when we are simulating stock, we can actually see those, you know, breaking through those holes and so forth. So that's just another option in here. There's no rules, but I mean, like, if you don't know what stock's going to look like, then I use relative size box. If you just have standard stock, uh, you know, a rectangle or square block, I use the fixed size box, so I actually put in what the stock measures. And then if you have something that is coming from somewhere else, another operation, or maybe a casting, use from solid and then model up the stock can be, can be really helpful. All right. I'm going to hit OK. Oh, I didn't select it. I'm going to select it first. And I'm going to go ahead here and hit OK for that, and then I can hide my stock. So now we have set up this work coordinate system here. Um, so that is extremely important. You know, that's the first thing we always do. Um, you know, um, and, and really it just takes a couple of minutes. I just kind of like went deep in there. But just remember, you know, what I just brought up about selecting the, the Z axis and the X axis. That's where you uh, control uh, that, um, where your directions of your axis is. Pick up your corner, G54, G55, and then set up your stock and, and you're pretty much set. So let's start applying some tool path to this part here. So the first tool path I'm going to go ahead and apply is what is called a facing operation. And if I hit the 2D drop down, you will see that we have a lot of different types of tool path uh, in here. They all kind of work the same way. So um, I'm going to start with a facing where we really just kind of like dressing off the top of our part. We many times do that to establish what we call a datum. Um, so I'm going to select that. And uh, the, we get the menu over here, and the five tabs are always the same, no matter what, uh, no matter what you, uh, what kind of operation you're within. This is extremely helpful. So you only have to learn once what these five tabs do, and you're all set. So you're not going to be thrown all different kinds of pop-ups, menus, and things like that. 
The first tab is always where we select our tool. And the tool, uh, because that's what you would do out on the shop floor too, right? You would, if you had to machine a part, you, the first thing you will say is, okay, what kind of tools do I have available? Uh, so I'm going to go here and click select tool, and that is going to open up uh, our tool library. Now, um, again, I just like when I talked about before um, about how to put the part inside of a device, uh, I created a video on that. I actually also have a video out on YouTube about the tool library. So if you want to dig into this uh, in, in, in greater depth, again, send me an email. I'll put it in the, in the question area, and I'll make sure that I get you that link for those videos. But what you have here, first of all, you need to be aware of this little uh, flyout button out here in the corner. What it does is it lets you select all your different libraries. You can actually uncheck or check different libraries in here. And what you get is you get a bunch of sample libraries. You can actually also create your own libraries in here. So these down here that says local are some that I have created for some of the different materials uh, that you might want to machine. Now, uh, that kind of like brings us into feeds and speeds. Um, feeds and speeds really depends on your type of machine, what kind of work holding you have, you know, the rigidity and things like that. So you definitely want to start creating things that fits your kind of environment. Now, I'm going to go into the tutorial inch here, and I'm going to select a face mill uh, to kind of like face off this part. So I'm just going to click on that and hit OK. And you will now see this face mill uh, appears over here. Now, you can put in all your different feeds and speeds here. You can also store those with the tool. Again, this video will, will uh, out on YouTube will teach you all that. Now, the next tab is where we're going to select our geometry. So the first tab is always the tool. The next tab is where we're going to select our geometry. Now, you will see here that I get like this orange box uh, up here and that's because the software is actually smart enough to know what we're trying to machine here so it says well if you are facing off this block you probably just want kind of the bound out of boundary and it pre-selects it for us but it's great because yes that's what I want so I don't even have to select any geometry now there's still two more tabs but I'm going to come back to those later we actually don't need those uh, for facing off so I'm going to hit OK to that and just like that, uh, I have created my, my first tool path. So I selected the tool on the first tab. The second tab is where you select the geometry, and, and we were good to go. Now we can now, we can go and simulate this, and this is why I was specific with the stock. And simulation is really your window um, out to what's going to happen at the machine. Many times, you know, you program, you know, in a completely different room, maybe another day. Um, so this is extremely important. So the simulation button is sitting right up here. I'm going to click on that, uh, and that will give me a couple of different options in here. I can actually turn on stock. So if I turn that on, you will see that now we actually get that stock. That was why now I have the holes in here, right? So that was why I picked uh, picked that option. Um, so let's go in here and see this. So I'm going to hit the play button down here, and it's going to go a little fast. We'll slow it down a little bit. So you will actually see the posit that it's machining off the top here, and I left there was a little bit of extra stock on that model, so you can kind of see that right how it's machining off that stock there. So like I said. This is extremely important uh, that you get a good representation of um, what's happening, you know, it's going to happen out of the machine. And the two other uh, webinars I did prior attack the whole stock a little bit different too. So definitely, again, if this is something where you're like, wait a minute, uh, a little confused, uh, they are definitely a great uh, resource too. So I've confirmed that my facing operation here, you know, this looks uh, pretty good. It's going to come up facing off here. Just take uh, that 50 thousands off the top that was left from the previous operation. Now, we, of course, got to apply more toolpaths to this part. Um, but um, 
At this point, you might want to post out code to your machine. So that is right next to the simulation button. So you can click on that, and uh, then you will get the post processor window. Um, in here, the software already ships with a bunch of different posts. And you, you should be able to find yours in here. If you can't find yours in here, there's also, if you go out to Google and you search uh, Autodesk Cam, post library you will get a website that has additional posts in there um, and we have a great forum uh, for post uh, also and this is extremely important that you get a good post uh, in this case here I have a generic for knock control but like there's all different kinds of in here there's a generic cars whatever you have also be aware of that there is some options you can actually control with your post over here many people miss this so if you for example, did have a chip conveyor on it, you could actually say yes, and that will be turned on in your post. So there's some different options in there. Be aware of that. I'm just going to post this code out here so we can take a quick look at it. It's, of course, going to be very short <laughs> because, well, it is, um, you know, just the facing operation itself we have here, right? We haven't done anything else. But you will see here that it calls out the post. It gives us uh, the tool chains for tool number one, the the spindle speed, G54, uh, and all that stuff. So that's how easy it really is to post out your code, right up here uh, on this one up here. All right, let's apply uh, the next tool path. Now, I'm going to go in and machine this pocket here for you. Uh, so I'm going to use what is called adaptive clearing. Um, I'm going to select that. And again, you will see the menus are again the same for this, right? Um, so the first one is always your tool. So I'm going to select a new tool. So let me go back down to, uh, to that uh, tutorial inch here. And I'm not quite sure. I think the pocket is fairly small. I'm going to select a quarter inch flat end mill right here. See how that goes. Looks pretty good in size. You can see it kind of like appears there. So I talked about before uh, that the next tab is our geometry. Before, we didn't have to select anything. We do have to do that here. Um, and um, in a little bit, when we come to this whole height thing down here, we're going to talk more about uh, geometry selection. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the inner uh, edge of this hole here. And I like to think about geometry edges are almost like guardrails uh, on the road. This is why we determine what our cutter will, will stay within. So I'm going to select this edge. And as soon as I do that, you will see that it kind of like um, gets uh, blue in here, dark blue. Um, and you can actually, there's a little arrow over here. You can flip the side if you want to on what side of the, of the uh, chain or the selection you want it to be. So I want it to be blue in here because this is what I want to remove. The next tab is the height tab. So I just want to take two seconds and talk a little bit about this one because people uh, sometimes get a little confused about this one. Um, so I said before, when you're setting up your, your work coordinate system, start from the top and work your way down. Uh, and that's my rule whenever, if you're modeling something up or whatever until we get to the height tab. Here, I actually like to reverse it. I say start from the bottom and work your way up. And the reason for that is that when we are talking about the height tab, uh, the bottom is what we care the most about. And then it kind of like decreases the amount we care about as, as, we, as we go up. So the first question is, well, how deep is my color actually going to cut? So that's why we're starting from the bottom, because that's what we most care about. How deep is it going? You will see here that it says selected contours. So if I click on the drop down, you'll see there's a lot of different options in here, but it's great. Selected contour for me is good here, because uh, that edge I selected was down at the bottom. Now, if I selected the top uh, edge, then I would have to change uh, that selection, right? Because then it would only machine to the to that selected contours. What I then could have done was I could have gone in here and selected selection and then instead have selected on the face uh, and picked that. So the bottom height is, is that, is how deep is my color going to cut. The next one is the top height. 
So the top height means how how high is my my uh, part really sticking up? And in this case here, it's set to stock top. Now we just we just did a face mill, so our stock top right now is the same as the model top. Um, but if we had not done the face um, uh, facing off operation, we would have another fifty thousands. Uh, if we had selected model top. So stock top is a good choice here. Then the next thing is the retract. So think about when you're drilling holes, you normally want the, the drill to retract up the hole, maybe, you know, a hundred thousands before it moves to the next hole. And the retract height is the stock top, what was the same thing we had down here in the height, plus an additional two hundred thousands. So it right now would move from the stock top, what we actually machined 50,000 off, and an additional 200,000. So from our model top, we're going 250,000 above. The clearance height is the one we're using, you know, to wrap it from feature to feature, from a tool change and so forth. And you will see that that is the retract height, what is the stock top, plus that 250,000s, plus an additional 400,000s. So that's kind of like our clearance height. So that's why I say just start from the bottom and just work your way up. They're kind of like building on each other like, like Lego blocks, and you should have, have no issue. Now in here, the next tab is the Passes tab. So the, that passes tab has everything to do with the cutter engaged in material. So now we actually, the cutter is in the steel. And here you can, you can set different things. You will see that you could actually do this in multiple depths if you wanted to. Um, you can leave stock to leave. So I have 50, 15 thousands on the side and on the bottom because the adaptive is a roughing operation. And the last one is linking, what means when the cutter is not engaged in the material. So this would be your lead in, lead out, how we're going to approach the part and all, uh, all those things. So just to recap, the first tab is always where you select your tool. The second tab is where you always select what you're going to machine. Third tab is the heights. Again, remember, just work from the bottom and up and you're going to be fine. Um, and the fourth tab is the passes tab. So think of the cutter being in the steel. And then the last tab is when the cutter is not engaged in the steel, uh, how is it going to approach within that? So I'm going to hit OK here. And you will see that we then get uh, our adaptive tool path here. Now, one of the great things about adaptive is that it's doing a constant uh, load on our cutter. So it's actually not uh, a problem to cut with the full length of the cutter. Now, again, feeds and speeds depends on your machine. But if I show you what we actually have here, you see that it's kind of like a helix down to the bottom. So let's go back in and look at our simulation. So we agreed on the first one was our uh, facing operation. So that looks good. And then you will see it's going to come in. It's going to helix out here, right? And then it's going to do this adaptive uh, roughing pass uh, right here, okay? And you will actually see, if I zoom in, you can actually see uh, that it shows me that there's material left over. You can also show this transparent over here. I can make it a little bit easier maybe. So we can see there's still material uh, left over. So the roughing, the, the adaptive is definitely a great tool path. I use it all the time. Um, you should definitely use it to rough out, but it's not a finishing tool path. So we're going to finish this part up here. So I'm going to go in and I am going to select uh, a pocket tool path to finish this up with. So again, I'm going to select that and the first thing is always uh, the tool. I'm going to keep it the same tool because that would actually work out here. Uh, for my case, but of course, depending on your tolerances, what you finish, you know, maybe you have a, a finishing end mill, same size or small or whatever. Also depends on your corner radiuses, right? Um, I'm going to go in and select my geometry. And again, this is where I will select the same edge in here. You see that it turns um, blue 
what means that um, you know that is staying within that side next thing is our heights tab again remember just work from the bottom up so its bottom is that select the contour like we had before that's perfect the top height is the stock of the top but it's fine then the feed height so now we have a feed height when the tool moves down how far is it from uh, from the part before it starts feeding down and here you will see is the top height what is this one down here that is the stock top plus an additional two hundred thousands maybe I would probably do fifty thousands if it was me um, the next thing is the retract so when it's done that would be the stock top uh, plus a two hundred thousand and so forth the clearance height is the retract height so this one plus four hundred thousand again like I said before it's kind of like it's building uh, building up next tab is the passes tab so uh, this is where again we're talking about uh, the cutter engaged in the material now you will see that stock to leave is turned on here but I don't want that so I'm just going to uncheck it and I can actually uh, create a finish pass in here so if I create a number a finish pass that means it's going to leave a 25 step over and just do the wall uh, with one extra pa pass. So it's going to go down to the right depth, and then it's going to machine out till there's 25 thousands. But actually, we probably should change that to 15 because that was the stock to leave from the adaptive, and then it will just take one nice pass around. Next tab is our linking tab. So how are we going to approach the part now? Since we roughed everything out. Uh, I don't need it to go helix here. I can actually just probably just plunge down because there's only the 15,000 at the bottom. So let me click OK to that. And, and I got nothing. So then we start doing troubleshooting here. So what did I do? There's actually, if you right click in here, there's actually something called show log. One of the more of the pockets was not machined because they're too small to reach with the given ramping constraint. Okay. This is what I love about doing these. Oh, see, I said plunge outside the stock. You see that? It's supposed to be plunge. Human error. Error between... Uh, there we go <laughs> between the keyboard and the chair so uh, so now you will see that it's gonna come down to the so now this one don't have any stock to leave so it's gonna come down to the bottom and then it's gonna machine out and you see how it kind of like leaves that little 15 thousands gap there just to make a nice finish pass so let's go ahead and uh, and simulate that so first again we're gonna face it off We're going to adaptive rough it out. Okay, I'm going to pause it here. Let's just zoom in here so we can kind of like see that last pocket pass. So it's going to come in here. It's going to plunge down. See how it finishes up the bottom right there? And then you will see that it's going to come out to the edge and then it's just going to do one extra pass the next one here oops that suck next extra pass right here is going to clean it all nice up okay so this is the steps uh to pretty much machine anything uh inside of uh fusion 360 like this you would kind of like go through and build it up like this and the, the tabs are are kind of the same but what i wanted to show today was a question I get from time to time and that is what when what we are picking is not uh, exactly you know <laughs> the easiest to deal with uh, when it comes to, to to geometry so what we have here like I said in the beginning is we have this face right here that is actually lower than these two faces over here so if I wanted to rough out uh, these areas and I'm just going to use again uh, the 2d adapter like we used before so I'm going to go and select the 2d adaptive 
I'm going to go back to, um, I'm going to go in and actually like the half inch cutter, I think, for this. So I got a half inch at a mill here. Use that. But what you'll be tempted to do when you're looking at this is that you're thinking that, well, um, if I want to machine this area down here, you know, I got to watch out that I don't machine into this. And you will actually see if I go over to the geometry tab and I select this edge down here, just click this edge, you will actually see that the blue shadow shows you that it would machine, it, it would literally machine these away, these two uh, tops here. And that is because that when you're doing 2D machining, like I said before, the chains are really like guardrails. So what the, it, this, the, this, the software does is it looks at the stock, so it knows how big the stock is, and then when you're selecting edges, it thinks of it almost like a guardrail that I got to stay away from this or I got to stay within this area. So the software don't see right now that it's going to cut through these. So if I just said OK right now, you will see that just in the preview, you can see that this, this is not pretty, right? This is not good. Um, well, if I go out here and I edit this, I go back into my geometry, to my chain, you might say, all right, well, you know, I'm going to contain it more then uh, because uh, of this issue. So I'm, I could, for example, say, well, why don't I just click this edge here so now I'm kind of containing within these two, uh, these two boundaries. So I'm just going to flip the arrow here. So now you could say, okay, now it's blue within here. So that looks pretty good. So let me go ahead and hit OK to that so we can take a look at that. And this is actually not too bad, but the software knows that it cannot fit between over here. So what we have now is partially of it being machined, right? Kind of like only those two sides. Well, here's a trick that you need to know about. And that is, let me go back to the geometry here. And I'm actually just going to clean up my two, my two chains here. Um, I'm still going to select this uh, here because I definitely don't want it to machine off our island. But when I'm looking at, at what we have here, and if I told you that think of these chains as kind of a guardrail, then what I really want the cutter to do is I want it to stay away from this line and this line, right? That would kind of like be the guardrails for the cutter because I actually wanted to let it go past on, on either end. So here's the trick that many people don't know. If I select this chain right here, you will see that it highlights the whole thing as a chain. But if I go in and select the same edge again, you see how it turns red? If I select the same edge again, I get this little dialog box that shows up. And here I can choose between closed contour and open contour. And what this is is an open contour. So I'm just going to click on that, and then you will see the whole chain boundary around here went away, and we only have that edge selected. So what I, when I go in and hit the little plus sign down here, I'm accepting that edge as a guardrail. And as soon as I do that, you will actually see that now the blue box is actually stopped right here. Now, it hasn't stopped over here because we haven't set that as our guardrail. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to select that edge. It selects the entire chain around here. I'm just going to reselect the same edge again when it turns red. Then in that little pop-up menu, I can select Open Chain and say I only want that ads and hit the little green plus sign. And now we get what we want here. We get that area uh, to be machined in that, in that depth. So let me click OK to that and clearly I selected wrong. So I get to do it again. So that is good. And then let me go in and select 
this edge here okay that looks good and select this edge here and hit OK to that okay looks good to me hit OK something is not right well that's just great right this is all good don't listen to me well I promise I did this earlier I'm missing something select that one I'm actually gonna go in and try to select this edge instead this one And this one. See, it looks like it will do it. There we go. All right, so that was just me. I selected the top edge. I selected the bottom edge. So now what we got, you know, I'm not going to quit on this. So now what we got is actually a tool path that we want. You see how it starts from the outside? And uh, then uh, it will start machining all the way around the part here. Thanks, Anthony. <laughs> yep, select the bottom edge. That was it. Uh, so, um, so now if we go in and we hit simulate, I'm not going to go through all the different tools. I can actually just go down and select whatever over in the feature tree over here, and it will get to uh, to that point. Now, if we simulate through here, we will now see that it's going to machine uh, this edge. Okay, so. That is how you can contain um, these different these different areas uh, within within the software to to uh, to get what what you want. Um, to show you another example on that could be you know we might want to chamfer around this boss. So we have a chamfer operation called 2D chamfer. I'm going to select that one. I'm going to go in and select the tool. Um, so that doesn't really doesn't really matter what tool we're using here. Select this one, and again, if I select this outer edge, it's going to now cham for all the way around. What you probably you know most of the time wants, but if we only wanted to just cham for this one side, just by selecting that same edge and hit the open contour we can now choose just to machine that one contour. Uh, we could also, we could do multiple selections. So again, if I select that edge and I click over and again, I hit open contour, I could now select, you know, this radius and this radius and hit uh, OK. So just be aware of that you have these uh, different uh, options in here when it comes to selection. Now, um, so I, if, this, if you felt like this whole selection thing went a little bit above what you were kind of ready for, uh, that's, that's okay. Um, then I would definitely recommend that you, you go back and check out those two other webinars because, like I said, I'm kind of trying to make them so you can kind of uh, build on them uh, a little bit as, as you're going uh, along here. All right, so I definitely want to open it up for questions because we got to make sure here that I, you know, I could talk for hours. Um, so I definitely want to open up for questions here. Let me just get the PowerPoint back up so I can uh, show my email address again. Uh, so you can get that one if you want to take it offline too. All right, so let me just see here. Just start typing in if you got any questions. Anything is allowed. Um, so the first one is in regards to Ali uh, asked the question, what if, if the machine that I have is not listed as my uh, post processor? Uh, and, and that, you know, that could definitely happen, right? Like there's hundreds and hundreds of, um, well, 
machines out there. But actually, mo it's not really what machine you got. It's actually more important about what controller you got on your machine. So, uh, for example, I used to run them at Sora uh, and a, uh, a Kitamara, two completely different manufacturers, but they both used Fanuc controls. So it depends on what kind of control you have. Um, that depends on what post you need. So, yeah, there's that whole drop-down list in there inside of the software. And um, if you don't have the post right there, definitely go out and check out uh, the CAM, the Autodesk CAM post library uh, list of posts. Uh, again, send me an email and, and, we can, and I'll link you to that site. Um, there's a lot more posts out there. So what we do at Autodesk is we're creating generic posts for as many as machines as we possibly can. We have a dedicated post team uh, that, that works on this, uh, and we will definitely help you. There is also, uh, you, can, you can actually modify your own post yourself. So, so the source code for this is, um, is, is, is open source, and I have actually done that in the past, because when you buy your machine, many times there's like a piece of sample code that comes in the manual, uh, and you can go in, the Fanuc control is actually probably the, the most generic of them all, and you can compare that to what you get in your manual, and they might be identical, and then you can just use the Fanuc uh, post. Uh, but you might want to tweak a couple of things, and you can actually go in and do that. And uh, there's a, a forum, post forum, where people help each other out with that too. Another option is to get a hold of one of our partners, and they can help you if you really, you can go crazy with post modifications. Like, I mean, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, there is a cost involved with that because, you know, I mean, now it's it's like, you know, like building a house, how big of a house do you want? Um, but yeah, start out by looking in the drop-down list, then go out to uh, the Autodesk Camp uh, Post Library webpage, and from there go to the forum and maybe ask there. But again, uh, my email right there. Um, does it automatically tell the machine to stop between tools uh, so you can change the tools? Uh, Levi asked. That's a very good. That's a very good question. Uh, it's actually right inside of your options here. If I jump back into to Fusion, so if I go into, for example, this 2D adaptive that we used, and let me go and edit that. Go into the tool. So we are using right in here a quarter inch end mill. If I right click on that and hit Edit Tool, the menu showed up on my other screen. You will get this little window here that has all kinds of in. Uh, um, you know, the flute length, the length of the cutter. Over here in the post-processing tab, there is actually a box to check for a manual tool change. So this means that if you, you know, not everybody has uh, tool carousels. Uh, so if you need to change the tools, you can check that. You can save that back with a tool. And now every time you call up that tool, it will just stop. So you can make that. Yeah. And the, the option right underneath it is if you have a... Uh, a table probe to check for your tool. You can also do that in there, and um, and then it will go over and check uh, for a broken tool if, if if that's if that's the case. All right. Um, next question is: When doing this process, is there a way to leave pocket or island stock? Uh, so, Lucas, I'm not 100% sure what you're talking I'm thinking that maybe you're talking about when I was selecting uh, this uh, adaptive here that was machining uh, that whole island here. Yes, so if I go in here and say edit, uh, I still have the stock to leave uh, in here. So I can just add uh, more to that, and that uh, should back it away. So let's try and make it, like, visual bigger. So now you can see that now it's actually not going around because it's leaving that hundred thousands around and it will hit in here. Yep, so you can do that. Cool. All right. Uh, we still got four minutes left, so um, um, I'll definitely take more questions. A machine that uses a Mac 3, uh, the Mac, I think that the Mac 3 
post processes was in there. I thought it was. Yeah, check that out for sure. If not, you know, again, send me an email. Um, let me get it back on the, on the email here. Send me an email if you get any more questions, and we um, and we deal with it. Yes, uh, the I will definitely make sure like that you get the recording for this. Um, as soon as we're done with this, I will uh, get it uploaded to YouTube, and then I'll make sure you can get the link for that. Uh, is there any art portion of your project that will require 3D processing? I'm confused as to when to use 2D and 3D. Uh, specifically, 3D drilling. I'm not sure about drilling, but I'm sure about milling. Uh, so the only time where we really look for... So the drilling in here really just works uh, for 2D. But the only time we are looking at 3-axis is when we have swoopy surfaces. Um, so um, I don't really want to go over. I only got three minutes. But um, if I go in here, if you, for example, went into like the, the sculpting environment here, see how how quick can I make something? So this part here, right, um, that has like some rounded corners on it or or something, uh, something like that. Uh, then where you have like these swoopy, swoopy areas here, right? This bicycle seat. Um, then you will use the three-axis machining to do that. Um, and I will definitely be more than happy to do a webinar on three-axis machining if you want to. I don't feel like that that falls great within these camp basic webinars. But hey. Send me an email, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. Or we maybe we, we just create a uh, a three axis webinar. I can also uh, I can also uh, do um, I can also do other type of webinars webinars of course or send you the link uh, link to that. Yes, Mike, so that is exactly the pencil and the scallop. Uh, that is uh, normally when you what you're using when we're getting into uh, where the, the walls are in tapered, where the 2D pocket will just kind of like work its way down uh, step by step, uh, the other ones will actually follow the angle. So maybe that is another uh, another webinar where we could talk something about uh, that kind of stuff. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to join um, me here today. Really um, appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy day to, uh, to, to jump in here. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, shoot me an email if you have any anything I can do it at least to help. Um, and um, until the next webinar, have an awesome, awesome day, guys. Thank you so much.